Hello, friends. I am pleased to be here today with LISD Superintendent Dr. Bruce Gehring. Dr. Gehring has been the superintendent of LISD since 2019 and has led the district through significant growth and change with both aplomb and tenacity. We are fortunate to have his leadership in these times. Dr. Gehring, welcome to On the Street. Thank you, Dwayne. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. I would like to jump right into our discussion today, which will focus on your vision and definition of inclusive leadership and cultural competency and how both connect to the LISD strategic plan goal number four of achieving equitable access. Are you ready to jump in? Let's do it. Perfect. Okay. So the last time we spoke, Dr. Garing, on the program, you mentioned that you started your teaching career in South Africa during the apartheid era. Reflecting back on that time, how do you think it impacted you with respect to your need for inclusive leadership and for cultural competency slash humility? You know, it's one of those things that at the time I had no idea what I was experiencing and the impact that it would have on me later in life. And then as I came to the United States and started hearing this conversation around equity yeah. and inclusion and really starting to understand what it meant for each and every individual as a human being, then it really started to come back to me all these experiences that I'd had and how oblivious I was to them at mm -hmm. the time. Um, and I think that's the power of that reflective moment is, is knowing, you know, that was not right and that was right. not good. Um, and I was a part of that at mm. the time. And the reason I was a part of it was because I didn't know any better. Uh, but now that I do know better, I have a responsibility to really act on that and take that forward. And so that's why I'm so passionate about bringing people into the conversation yes. and really helping them to understand that perspective of, you know, you have a unique opportunity here to mm. do some really incredible work. Um, and you have a responsibility to make sure that you do because you know. Right. And I think that's so, so, so important. And how old were you when you started that journey, when you started teaching? So I started uh, teaching um, when I was 22. Yeah. Um, and uh, brand new in, in a classroom in Soweto, um, the black township outside Johannesburg. Um, really naive, <laughs> really green. <laughs> As we all were back then. <laughs> Knowing what I know now, I wish in some respects I could go back yeah. and do it over. What um, would you do differently? You know, I think um, there's a lot of things I wouldn't do differently mm -hmm. because instinctually I think I knew that every one of those kids uh, brought this real deep drive to mm -hmm. the table of wanting to achieve more and wanting to be more. Um, and they knew that education was their ticket to that more. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I would be so much more sensitive to the needs of the individuals mm -hmm. based on the circumstances they were coming from. Um, I made lots of assumptions about who they were and, and their lives um, because of my own experiences, right. which were totally different. Right. And I just had no context, no no way to frame you know, what they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that, that gave me a lack of empathy in the moment. Well, and no, and, and the wisdom of age and experience <laughs> then informs that, right? Yes. No, I think when, when I look back on um, when I started teaching, I was 23, and there were many things that I took at face value about my students, which allowed me sometimes to overcorrect for things that really weren't there. And one of the things I've learned about cultural competency is that, you know, the in, the dosing of the intervention, whatever it is, it has to match the moment. It's just like medicine. Too much medicine can do damage. Too little medicine is not effective. And when it comes to understanding cultural competency, I think it's important for us to see the individual child so that whatever intervention we apply, it meets the moment. And that was something that I had to learn. And I love what you said about age and wisdom. Because yeah, there were a lot of things that I would change, but a lot of things I wouldn't because instinctively I, I wanted my students to be better than me, you know, to have more opportunity. Yeah, and isn't, isn't that what our cha charge is really is to, to help them to become more than they think they can become. Exactly. Or what society says they should be. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm sure that for many of your students in Soweto uh, growing up under that system, many of them 
it was almost impossible for them not to see themselves in deficit terms. And so they saw education as the vehicle by which to, I talk a lot about achieving escape velocity when it comes to one's marginalization. And I think education can allow that for students, but it starts with all of us seeing the individual student you know, because I think sometimes when we overlay the group dynamic and we overlay identity, we don't see the individual child. And I think it's important, like when we say how you see that individual student, really understanding their humanity yes, and, and all that comes with that, mm-hmm. but also seeing the potential that's mm-hmm. there because there's such a unique potential in every human being. Mm-hmm. Um, and our job is to really unlock and unleash that potential. Yes. No, I I couldn't agree more. And and I think that when you look at students for who they can be, as opposed to what they presently present or some narrative you may have in your mind, you have a better chance of inspiring them to do more, be more, and see more. And that's the, uh, you know, I often talk about the, the majesty and the artistry of teaching. And to me, that's where it is. When you inspire students to look beyond whatever circumstance that they're currently going through and see downrange what they can become. Yeah, and I don't know what you've seen, and perhaps you can elaborate on this a little bit, but what, what I've experienced is that it takes sometimes really connecting that individual to things that they are interested in and that they can become passionate about over time. Um, but but sometimes it's really hard to do when there's so much negativity surrounding that situation. No, I, I would agree. I think when I look at the teachers who inspired me, um, obviously people know that my first love is aviation. I had teachers who found ways to connect me to that by bringing me books or talking about things that they went on a trip and what kind of plane they were on. And then I remember one teacher uh, bringing in a relative who was a flight attendant, finding ways to inspire me, but also showing me that this is something that you can do. Because the negativity you you reference, Bruce, is so important for people to strip away. Because if you are a person who grew up in somewhat of a marginalized environment, it's hard sometimes to see past all of that because all of your marginalization, on the one hand, becomes your security blanket because it's so common and it, and it's so it becomes comfortable, but it also becomes a blinder and you can't see forward. And that's where teaching comes in. Because our job is to help them to see, yeah, you can do that, you know, no matter where they come from or who they are. Yeah, and and the other thing I've learned over time is that sometimes it's not the obvious, right? So the the worst Mm -hmm. cases that I've experienced really are the ones who appear very normal, very settled, very, you know, Mm -hmm. competent on the outside. And yet we have to look deeper than that, right? And sometimes we have to scratch a little bit at the surface to get at what's underneath there. Yes. And and some of the barriers that exist even in those what look like easy cases, right, that can Mm -hmm. be very complex. No, I I agree because I think that part of this period that we're living through is that people have become very good at masking whatever it is that they're going through. And and sometimes we don't we don't give people the space students to admit that there are challenges. We know that students will cover up needs that they have because they don't want to be judged. And I think as teachers, educators, our job is to put them in a position where they feel comfortable saying, you know, I, I do need that help, you know, because I am struggling with this. And I also think that sometimes it's not just deficits, right? So mm-hmm. sometimes we are not providing opportunities um, Mm -hmm. that could really help someone to fly yes Uh, and because they're doing fine in all the things we say they should be doing fine checking all the boxes yeah they're checking all the boxes Mm -hmm. then we say well that's enough well no everybody deserves to grow to their maximum potential whatever that is yes sometimes it really takes us getting outside of our own boxes Mm -hmm. to say how do i provide you those opportunities to let you fly Yes. And part of that is controlling for our biases, which sometimes they're not always negative. I mean, sometimes we look at a student and we figure, to your point, they're doing very well. So we don't have to invest in this student because they're going to make it no matter what. But are they growing? And and I think that's something that we all have to examine. When I look at my career, there was a time when if the students were performing at the upper levels of the performance envelope, 
I felt that they didn't need me as much as the students who were struggling. But as I matured as a practitioner, I realized that wasn't true. And to your point also, sometimes you have to pick a way and put them in a position where they say, you know what, Ms. Street, I do need that. And the last thing I'll say is I think um, we also have to force each human and each learner to take responsibility for who they are and who they're going to become. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hard for some people because yeah. they don't want to take that responsibility. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, it's a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And so that that's something that as coaches, as mentors, as teachers that we have to do, we have to really push them to say, you've got to want to do this and you've got to do it yourself. I'm just here to help you and facilitate that happening. That's, that's very well stated because I think that transfer of ownership that we have to cultivate, uh, and you talk about this throughout the system, you know, we have to, ownership of learning is very important. I mean, you've talked about that many times. And I think that a lot of students are afraid to own that because they don't think they can carry the expectations that come along with that. Our job is to let them know they can. Yeah. And also the adults in our system sometimes because change is, is hard because you, you don't know what the other side presents. You don't know if the expectations on the other side of that change are expectations that you can carry. This is why leaders in the system, we have to inspire people to want to make that leap. Yeah, and I think we have to model it, right? Yes, so we do. We have to model that it is a struggle sometimes and mm -hmm. it is a challenge sometimes. It's not easy, um, but if it wasn't easy. Everybody would do it, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and those feelings of impostorship are real, you know, so it's the unknown. So I'd like to move on to to another, you, you talk a lot about, you know, equitable access. And when you and I first met, that was one of the things that we spent a lot of time talking about. And so when you think about equitable access, what does it look like for our students, families, and staff today? And what do you want it to look like five years from now, Dr. Gary? So I think for me, equitable access has never really been a thing. It was never a separate thing because mm -hmm. it is the thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's the main thing. Um, and for me, the way we phrase it here in Leander is that it's about each and every. Mm -hmm. And that each and every is unique. And we have this responsibility to develop that unique. But in order to develop that potential, we have to first really uncover that uniqueness. And we have to know and understand who that unique individual is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's adults and kids, Yes, um, all the learners in our system. But then we also have to make sure that they know who they are because if they don't take that extra step and they don't own this is who I am and this is where I'm at, mm -hmm. then they cannot go forward. Right? Right. And so, yes, we, we put a label on it and we set goals around it and we put it in the strategic plan, but really it's the work of every single interaction that we have every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and there are billions of those interactions happening every single day in our system. Yes. I um, mean, every one of them counts because they build on each other. Um, and so when each individual interaction is right and works, then you get this beautiful synergy that mm -hmm. grows out of and swells out of the, the ground that becomes this really powerful force. No, that reminds me of an expression. Um, you and I have talked about this. All of my graduate work and postgraduate work is in adult education. And in adult ed, we talk a lot about each one must teach one. And those, all those interactions that, that take place every single day, equitable access is not about grand designs. And I love the way you framed it. It's just what we do. It's not about all these grand designs and, and large movements. It's in those one-on-one -on -one engagements with people in the system. You know, are you providing them with the skills they need, the access they need to fulfill their role as an employee and their dreams as a student? Are we doing that? And that happens in those one-on-one -on -one engagements because most of the, the, the people who inspired me were people um, that I had conversations with, like what we're doing right here. It wasn't that I went to some rally or some uh, large event. It was when a person pulled me aside and said, Dwayne, I know you're afraid of what comes next, but you need to keep moving forward. And and I think that's what we're trying to do here. Yeah, and I... I'm terrible at remembering who said what, but somebody famous once said <laughs> that it, it's really about the individual, right? It's just mm -hmm. the action that I take today is what changes what happens in the future. And so um, when I look back at the history of our district, 
um, there's this really powerful past that that where all these moments have come together. Um, and if you look on the wall in in Leo and and see the journey that the district has taken, you can almost pick out those individual moments, those individual interactions where things changed significantly mm -hmm. because of the action of one person or you know the thought that they had about what it was we needed to have a conversation about right um and that then becomes this force of the future that drives us forward to uncovering this uniqueness and developing this potential um and and it's really a it's as easy as that it's about what is this first little step that i personally have mm -hmm. to take in order to bring people into the conversation to bring them together um, so that we can continue to create clarity through dialogue I love that too, you know, um, clarity through dialogue. A lot of times uh, when you want to change things, uh, individuals don't do a really good job of making a case through dialogue about why we want to change. And I think our system, we do a really good job of making a case and making sure that people are aligned because in, in my practice, what I found is alignment is so important. We don't always have to agree, but we always have to be aligned. And the alignment, if you look at the wall in Leo, you can see those points when the system became aligned. And so I, I go back sometimes and look at that wall and, you know, I look back at 1995 in particular when I think the district read the fifth discipline. You know, that was, I remember reading that when I was in grad school, that was a powerful book. And so it leads to alignment. And, but that alignment has to be coupled with dialogue. And and it's true, you know, the fifth discipline is a great example of systems thinking, mm -hmm. right? And how important it is for us to have systems as a large organization like we are. And the alignment is absolutely critical. Um, and that doesn't take away from this individual action and individual thought. It actually just frames it differently. Mm -hmm. So instead of creating a system and then trying to force people into the system to fit where they don't necessarily fit. Right. It's about making sure that we're creating the right space for each individual and then letting all of those things come together to form the system the way that it needs to be and the way that it needs to work. Um, it's, it's, it's a self-organization. Mm -hmm. It's an organic process that mm -hmm. nature does all over the place in right. different, all the different time. ways. Um, but, it, but it feels and seems chaotic a lot of the time. And it's really kind of messy in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to come to embrace that and acknowledge that and say, that's okay. We don't know all the answers. No. We don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. We do know that if we come together and, and work on it together, that we'll figure it out and it will work out. No, I, I think that has been, when I think about my journey in organizations I've worked on, I worked in, it has been messy. But it, if you are intentional and consistent, and we're talking about equitable access. If we're intentional and consistent in our mission, we will get there. And it is messy sometimes. It's, I've used the analogy, it's like a white shirt and a plate of spaghetti. It's just a matter of time, you know. But it's okay, although I do have to say I could eat spaghetti with a white shirt and be totally fine. <laughs> I believe I that. I can pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> so in LISD, we often say that it is different here. How does that statement translate to our approach for enhancing equitable access for each and every student here in LISD? And how is our practice around equitable access different from uh, other places, Dr. Gehring, that you've, you've seen? I think one of the key things um, about Leander ISD and the culture that we have here is that we're prepared to acknowledge mm. where mm. we're missing the mark. Mm. We're prepared to say we're focused on equitable access because there really isn't equitable access yet. Right. And our job is to create that um, and to make sure that each and every, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that each and every gets what they need in our system. We're a very large, very complicated, right. very complex system. And we know that we fail some of the time in some situations. What's important is how we react to that failure and, and, and what we do about it. So are we prepared to listen? Are we prepared to really search for what are the barriers? Are we really prepared to identify those things? And then are we really prepared to do something about it at a very granular level? Mm -hmm. um, because really it's got to be about what is the experience for each and every 
individual in the system how what is that end user mm -hmm. experience and 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 what are we doing about making sure that it works for that individual um because when it does then it becomes really powerful yes um but it doesn't always no and and i think we have to acknowledge um one of the things that i that I've become a fan of over my journey as a practitioner are process maps. I love process maps because when you construct one, you can see exactly where the breakdown is. And I think our system does a really good job of identifying where the breakdown is for students who are not experiencing the access levels that we want them to experience. But now we have to translate that into not only closing where those gaps are, but sustaining those closures. And I think the combination of being intentional and also the cultural competency piece, because our demographics are changing, which is going to lead us to our next question. You know, how do we prepare people to see the individual student as our demographics are changing so that you can see where they're not experiencing the access levels that we want them to? Because once we start to combine those two, and I think we're doing a really good job of that right now, but being a continuous improvement district, we can always do better, then each and every student will experience the levels of access that we want them to. I think it's really important for us to stay curious, right, and to mm -hmm. keep asking mm -hmm. deeper questions. Because as we look at data, for example, mm -hmm. what the data should do for us is force us to ask better questions and to figure out, you know, what is actually going on here? And right. what we find is that often the what we get out is unexpected. Mm -hmm. It's not what we thought at the beginning. I think that's one of the things that going back to the first topic we talked about that I've learned over time is that what I thought was the problem when I was in South Africa and what I think about what the problem is now are two very different things um, mm -hmm. because of all the experiences. But th that we've got to be open to that unexpected resolution, I think. I agree. And I think that part of being open is when people ask questions, we have to create, we have to make sure the environment is one where they can raise questions without judgment. Because I think that when people feel that they can admit, I do have questions about this, I, I do wonder about this, and I am struggling with this, that's how people learn. And that's how our system gets better. And one of the things that you and I uh, talked about many times since I've been here is making sure that we have an environment where people feel they can bring things forward. And because I think we've tried to do a really good job of having our practice be free of drama and judgment. It's about how do we take what people are telling us, do what we think is the best thing in the moment, but be open to we may have to amend it. And that's one of the most powerful things I've ever witnessed was when Bishop Desmond Tutu yes. brought the peace and reconciliation mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. to South Africa in a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of people who didn't think that was a good idea. I remember that. Because it was so challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but that speaks to you know this openness to listening. Um, but it also speaks to being able to own the fact that I've messed up, that I made a mistake, or even worse, that I did something that really affected somebody's life in a very deep way mm -hmm. um, and how do i own that how do i apologize for that how do i come how do i even bring that to the table to understand how we go forward um, but it takes two sides to that right so if i'm going to do that i won't do that if i know there's there's retaliation coming um, i can only do that in a safe uh, environment and that is part of what we call culture which is a very difficult word <laughs> to kind of get your arms around. Um, but I think that has to be our culture. Mm -hmm. um, one of, yes, we want you to come to the table as difficult as it is, and we want to be able to work it out. No, I, I think that right there is what makes us different. And when you look at how we practice and the way we do the work, we want a culture and we are striving. And I think we've made a lot of progress where we know that there are people who have done some things um, that they are not reflecting on, and all of us are in that situation. But how do we sit around the table without all of that judgment so that people can be open and honest and say, this is where I dropped the ball, 
I'm admitting that, and I would like to do better. To me, that's how we go forward. Yeah. I, I remember when Dr. Uh, Tutu brought that to South Africa. Were you still in South Africa when that happened? Wow. Okay, that's another offline conversation, Dr. Gary. It, it is. Uh, <laughs> living through moments in history yeah. that at the time is just life. Mm -hmm. But when you look back, uh, you go, wow, that was an incredible turning point. It was. Uh, it's, it's sobering. And it was a model for the whole world because the whole world was watching what was going to happen there. I remember um, vividly the day that Nelson Mandela got released from prison. I mean, it was, no one thought that that would happen. And then he becomes president and you see that whole journey of the full circle moment and the movie Invictus, it's almost impossible to know what it was like during that time. But I think they do a really good job of transporting us back to the, the tension. Cause you and I've talked about that, that we have to be able to live in the tension between the two sides as we go forward. And when you look at, um, Nelson Mandela, what he was able to do, I've often tried to emulate that as much as I can. I think that concept of tension is so important because our natural instinct is to make tension go away. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want that. I don't like that. It feels uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But tension is often very necessary in order to resolve issues. And, and often tension itself is not resolved. Right. It, it is managed and we have to figure out how to manage the mm -hmm. tension in such a way that it really gets us closer to where we're wanting to go um invictus actually did a remarkably good job of having lived through that exact experience yeah. of of painting that picture um yeah some movies don't do that i know that particular one uh, got pretty close yeah one of my all-time favorites so dr garing like many school districts in central texas LISD has experienced significant demographic shifts over the past decade. What leadership lessons would you share with the next generation of educational leaders regarding how to lead in increasingly diverse environments? It is definitely surprising how um, our specific demographics are shifting. Um, for example, uh, our newest elementary school, Heisel Elementary School, um, has close to 50% of the new students who are qualifying in the language proficiency program. Um, but those students are not Spanish speaking, those students are South Asian. Um, and there's multiple different languages involved in that. And so the demographic shift is unexpected in some ways, um, but also, uh, challenging to embrace and understand because we've always prepared ourselves for a certain demographic shift that we thought was coming. And Dr. Garen, going back to something you said earlier, you talked about how when you were in South Africa, you thought that certain things were impacting your students and then you found out later on that that really wasn't it. I think it's the same way with the demographic shifts. We, we were expecting one set of demographic shifts and now we're seeing something completely different. So it, it's all about being curious, you know, making sure that we stay open to what's really happening so that we can respond to it instead of responding to what we think is happening. I think that's so important and also then my solution to all of that is going back to each and every. And so when when things go unexpectedly, when you come back to like, this is just a human being and there's exactly. a uniqueness and a potential inside this human being. Mm -hmm. And my job is just to figure that out and then figure out ways to unleash that potential. Mm -hmm. Then then the conversation changes, I think. Um, I've really learned over time that that, Things that seem unsurmountable mm -hmm. and, and too difficult to solve, if you just go back to the individual and say, well, what, what, what is it that you need in this situation? Like, what, tell me what your experience is and what, what can we do together to, to make this better? Usually, it can be worked out at that level for that person, for that situation. And then, if you're doing that with everyone, then slowly but steadily over time, and it does take time. It's not a quick fix. As you think about how you would help new leaders come, who are coming into education, 
in Central Texas, which is experiencing a significant demographic shift, you would urge them to see the individual because it takes away a lot of the trepidation, which ties into something I've always said, Dr. Gary. People will ask me, because of the nature of my role, how do I connect with this group of students or that group of students? And I would always say, take that out of it. Ask yourself, how do I connect with this child in front of me? I think the other mistake we make a lot of the times is we also group situations and incidents together and we say, oh, this is that. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, well, let me go and find out what this really is and find out what the root causes are and find out what's really happening here. Um, and when you do that, it sometimes goes, well, I thought it was that, but it's really this. Mm -hmm. and, and that changes everything about how you react. And that's the beauty of who we are as human beings is mm -hmm. we're, we're the only creatures on earth who have this ability to pause <laughs> yes. and to reflect mm -hmm. and to say, hold on a second, what should I do next? Instead of instinctually reacting, which sometimes we do mm -hmm. and usually we regret. And you have to be mature as a practitioner to get there. You have to be able to say, I thought I knew what was going on, but now I realize I don't. So, Dr. Gehring, we know that demographic shifts in systems and school districts come with a whole set of assumptions for leaders. What assumptions would you ask leaders to guard against as they manage these demographic changes? I don't think it's so much observing what we should do differently, but rather embracing and celebrating what those demographic shifts bring to the table. Um, that diversity brings so many opportunities to do things in a different way, to celebrate different ways of thinking, to really honor um, culture and learn new cultures. And so I, I, I urge our leaders to, to think about it from that perspective of saying, like, this is an opportunity for us to learn together and in different ways than we ever dreamed were possible. I, I totally agree because I think new ways of doing things, new ways of knowing, that's what these demographic shifts can bring for our system, right? As we think about our our journey as a district, and I think you've done a wonderful job here today, Dr. Gary, of laying out your vision and your mission and sharing some of your experiences. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our community about how you see equitable access and cultural competency? I think it's a very conscious decision. We have to be very intentional about it. I mm -hmm. think we have to be very purposeful in how we prepare ourselves for conversations, for example. Um, knowing what you're walking into before you walk into it really can help you in the moment because mm -hmm. in the moment, all kinds of things happen and they usually happen really fast. And if you're not really well prepared mm -hmm. and have reflected on who you are and what you want to accomplish in that moment, we can get crossways and, and say things and do things that get us in a lot of trouble and really quickly. Um, and so I, I, I really urge us to be thoughtful as we and intentional as we go into conversations mm -hmm. um, to understand what it is we're walking into and how we're going to manage ourselves in that. We can't manage other people. No. We can't, we can't control what they do and what they say. Um, but we can control our reactions to what they do and what they say. Um, and that becomes more important than anything else. And if everybody's trying to do that, obviously we're going to fail <laughs> at times and we're going to say the wrong thing and do the wrong thing. Um, as long as we own that and learn from it and do better next time, um, I, think, I think we can do this. And I think that part of uh, that whole equation too is if we say something that we – realized wasn't the right thing and were sincere about apologizing, the side that was offended or the person who was offended, they have to provide grace as well. So only for that equation to continue to work itself out. I think grace is, is such a beautiful word and so important in our world and, and so lacking in our world really is. Fortunately, I would agree. It, we need to model more of that for our young people. I think we need to be careful too of the, the term cultural competency. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's, we sometimes think that it's that mm -hmm. that definition of culture is one thing only, right. um, but it's really multiple things. Um, and we need to. That's why when you look at the individual and their circumstances, mm -hmm. there's often multiple different things at play mm -hmm. that affect how we should respond in terms of cultural competency to mm -hmm. that situation. And so it's not just about race. No, it's not just about language. 
It's not just about mm-hmm. social economic status. It's not just about religion. It's all encompassing. It's about all of those things. Mm-hmm. And, and the way that they interact with each other and the way that they come together mm-hmm. is very different in different people, which is why grouping people together is very dangerous. And counterproductive. And, you know, one of the concepts that we talked, we included in the earlier part of our conversation is there's cultural competency. And one of the things that I've learned on my journey is there's also cultural humility, which is the next step in that evolution. Because cultural humility is when you enter the space and you say, I know that this is very complex culture in this one individual is not the same as it is in an individual who you would think comes from that same background or that same group. And it speaks to the whole diversity within groups. So as we go on this journey as a system, we want to migrate towards that cultural humility piece, which is, I think, what you're lifting up. You know, cultural competency is a starting point, but the ultimate goal is to get to that cultural humility piece. Dr. Gary, I want to thank you for joining us today as we start uh, a brand new school year. Your insights and your passion for public education make us all better. I also want to thank you for your continued support for the Office of Educational Access. It is very much appreciated and valued, sir. We hope to continue our dialogue in future episodes of On the Street. We'd love to have you back um, because every time you hear, it's always engaging. I know our listeners, and this time our viewers are getting a lot of value out of your conversation with us today. Well, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for your team and your office. And thank you for having me today. It's really been an honor and a privilege. Thank you, Dr. Gary. Mm-hmm.